Hello, everybody. We are the Wildlife Wire, and we are back with our next episode of Wildlife Biologists Rank the Animals of Planet Zoo. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched our videos before, we'll do some brief introductions. My name is Dominic Noche. I received my bachelor's degree in wildlife biology from the University of Montana, and I've been working on several different uh, carnivore projects over the years, mostly across North America and a little bit in Southern Africa. And I'm currently working with bobcats in New York. And I'm Justin Ruby. I also got my bachelor's in wildlife biology from the University of Montana. Um, I have worked previously as a research technician and most recently have done a lot of uh, wildlife education. And you're probably noticing from if you've watched some of our other videos that Lane Arthur is not here. Uh, he is starting his master's degree at Utah State University. So he will be taking a brief hiatus to get adjusted to all of that craziness that graduate school puts on people. So we wish him the best of luck and he'll be supporting the channel from afar, but he needs a little bit of a break right now. So it's just gonna be me and Justin for, for now. Um, but today, we are covering the raccoon. This uh, this gets us about halfway through the twilight pack animals, which I think is a, is a surprise to get that level of consistency right away, for sure. Um, but I guess to start off, what do you think of this raccoon model, Justin? Um, you know, color-wise, I think it's, it's pretty good. Um, the mask looks pretty spot on. Yeah. And as does like the tail markings. I think my only issues with the model are some of the animations. Like it's kind of walk right now looks pretty good. But mm -hmm. when it was running earlier, it, it kind of seemed really uh, kind of static, I guess. Like not like the movements weren't as organic as I would hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like it as well. Um, I don't know if this is just because it's on my end, but it seems like looking at the eyes through the mask you can't really see the eyes so i don't know if that's also happening on your end or not um yeah it seems like, like when... even even though that mask is dark you can still see the eyes pretty pretty well through the mask yeah so um that's like really the one thing i'm noticing but other than that this is gorgeous and you know for like your average raccoon obviously like raccoons because they've got such a wide range that we're, we're going to get into they can have so many different body proportions depending on what habitat they're living in how close it is to people how much food and resources are available so you know this is a pretty good like standard raccoon that somebody would see in their neighborhood but that's not the case for raccoons across their whole range but this is this is really good representative of your average raccoon for sure yeah so yeah, like if you if you were to go to a zoo this would probably be like the raccoon that you would see yeah I, I i like it a lot though yeah so to start off the scientific name for the raccoon is procyon lotor uh so procyon means near dog so the fact that some people looked at this and saw it as similar to dogs such as wolves foxes coyotes things like that uh, and Lotor means actually to wash, which is a famous stereotype that we have with the raccoon, of course, washing its food before eating. And we will talk about that a little bit later. But the raccoon, and specifically, this is the common or northern raccoon. Believe it or not, there's actually multiple species of raccoon that aren't normally talked about. So this is the one that everybody knows really well because it's so common and widespread. And this animal is native to most of North America as well as a good chunk of Central America. And But there are two other raccoon species. You have the crab-eating raccoon, which is found in Central and South America. It's a bit smaller and slimmer if I had to describe it for some people. Tail is usually a bit shorter as well. And then you have the Cozumel Island or pygmy raccoon, which is very similar to the common raccoon, except it's rather small because it lives on a tiny island. And that one's actually endangered. Uh, but this is the common or northern raccoon that everybody 
is well familiar with and it is the key representative of its family the raccoon family procyonidae which contains those three raccoon species as well as the coatis which are very similar to raccoons but they kind of have this uh kind of flexible trunk like nose if i had to describe it as well as their their tails usually they hold them straight up a lot of the time so coatis are in that group there's several different species of coati as well and then you also have something that some people may be familiar with the kinkachu or the honey bear that is a member of procyonidae as well as some closely related um species called the alingos there's a couple of those they look very very similar to a kinkajou and they're a lot more obscure so people probably haven't heard about those as much um, and then finally you have the ringtail and the cacomissile which are kind of like raccoons with short muzzles and really long tails but they look really cool some people even uh with the ringtail they would call it a ringtail cat and it does have a bit more of some cat-like features for this group of carnivores for sure in our video today we have a raccoon in a eastern united states woodland um kind of a mostly deciduous forest not quite as dense as i would like it to be because their forest can be pretty dense um, with foliage but due to the limitations of planet zoo we kind of had to work with what we got i think if planet zoo were to make more um like another temperate pack. I think some more deciduous trees and like kind of saplings would be a really good idea. Plus some more, uh, maybe some bigger leafy uh, bushes and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess that really ties into the reason we chose kind of Eastern United States for this representative habitat is because when Europeans were arriving to North America to colonize, they're documenting all the the new fauna that they're seeing and in a lot of these early accounts of raccoons they're very much described as being an animal found mostly in riparian uh forests so forest along uh, river banks and river sides with rivers cutting through them that seemed to be the habitat that raccoons were really specializing in for a long time and that makes sense we when it comes to raccoons we always think of them hunting in the water, washing their, you know, dunking their food in the water before eating it. A lot of, um, you know, things like fish and um, marine invertebrates or aquatic invertebrates are, are very commonly seen as, as popular food for raccoons in a more forested setting. And that's because that's probably what they were doing most of the time. But of course, as human colonization came and habitat modification was done and you had predator extermination, these guys flourished and so the raccoon population has absolutely exploded because of that they've done just like the red fox they've done really really well with human alterations of the landscape and so that's allowed them to expand into probably far more of the country naturally than they used to be in in places such as mountains and uh, prairie even so these guys have really kind of taken off and that's why they're so common in suburbs and cities and people see them and, and recognize them all the time is, is because we've created perfect conditions for raccoons, most importantly, exterminating predators because that seemed to be really putting a cap on where raccoons could move around to before this. Just to kind of give an anecdotal example, uh, a few years ago, I was working in Glacier National Park doing Canada Lynx surveys using camera traps, but we had camera traps across the whole national park looking at and cataloging just every species that we captured on camera. And it was a three-year field, field study. And as far as I know, from those full three years, we only detected one raccoon that entire time. Just And then contrast that with you know, a lot of other places where it's very predator deprived, you don't have that intact carnivore guild. And so having things like bears and big cats and wolves and, you know, even the smaller stuff like healthy populations of bobcat and coyote, that can re really put a lid on raccoon populations to the point that they're not really around and they're actually something that's kind of rare to see. But you remove that, boom, they explode.
And so that's what we've seen here in, in North America a lot with the Northern Raccoon is why it's done so well and been so successful and, and really widespread to this day. But that's not always the case. So for example, raccoons used to be documented when colonialism started in Cuba and Hispaniola, and they very quickly went extinct there. And even then there's some other Caribbean islands that did have raccoons where they, they eventually went extinct. And you do have a couple of uh, Caribbean West Indies islands that still do have raccoons that as it turns out from some, from some later genetic testing, we thought maybe it was like Cuba and Hispaniola where these raccoons had gotten there naturally. Uh, but it turns out that these were raccoons that people had brought over intentionally. So they're not actually native. And so they had done a lot of genetic testing, not just on some of the raccoons that are remaining on some of these islands, but even uh, places like Jamaica where they have gone extinct and they were able to confirm, yeah, these are just raccoons from the Eastern United States that people brought over fairly recently and they're not actually native to these islands. So for the most part, raccoons are doing really well, but there are places that we did lose them and island ecosystems in particular are very vulnerable to extinction, of course. So it's not too, too surprising. Sure. yeah and and similar similarly when we're talking about islands um the channel islands off of california there was let's see the like outbreak of canine distemper was actually related to raccoons being i can't remember if they were brought over or if they basically stowed away on ships over to the islands oh and so like a few made their way over there and you know being a caniform and everything they were yeah. carrying canine distemper and then came into contact with the foxes and being foxes that have no immunity to it, um, they had to be vaccinated to prevent significant uh, die-offs of the foxes because there was a very sensitive island foxes there that are only found on those islands and nowhere else in the world. Right. And that even ties into the fact that it's not just other parts of the United States that they've expanded into. There's uh, parts of Europe and also in Japan where raccoons have been introduced. And in Europe, it was actually the, there was some Nazi officer was the one who introduced them to Germany because he wanted to have a ton of different species all to hunt in this particular area. And that's something that you see with a, with certain types of hunters is that they want to hunt different animals, but they don't want to have to travel to where the animal actually lives. So they, import it to where they're living and they create an invasive species and that's exactly what happened with raccoons in what in western and central europe and so germany you know they've got kind of a big problem i wasn't able to find too much on on what they're doing to kind of put a candle on it but uh they spread into northern italy for example so northern italy is trying really hard to eradicate them um, the netherlands as well um, but they can just cause severe damage. Like, for example, in Poland, there was documented accounts of raccoons going into bat hibernaculas where the bats will sleep for the winter and just devouring the bats. And we have a really big bat crisis right now, so that's mm -hmm. pretty bad. And then you also have in Japan a ton of endemic life because, as we've said, islands tend to have endemic life, which we mentioned in the Okapi video it just is not found anywhere else. So this is all you've got to work with and you need to keep it safe in this one particular area. And so there's a lot of uh, endemic species like salamanders and crawfish in the freshwater ecosystems of Japan that these invasive raccoons are hammering. And J in Japan's case, the reason that that happened is because raccoons became popular because of some sort of uh it was either a manga or an anime that had a raccoon character in it and so people were buying pet raccoons and either realizing oh this isn't worth it and letting them go into the woods or those pet raccoons would escape and it created this new population and it was from several different founder events because they've done the genetic testing that this is something that was going on for a long time and it's throughout most of japan and it's kind of hard to pick up on, I feel like, if if you're exposed to Japanese culture, because Japan does have the native raccoon dog, which it's it's a dog, but it looks very, very similar to a raccoon. And so in Japanese, they use the word tanuki to refer to both. 
And so there's a lot of raccoon related cultural stuff that you'll think about in Japan. And that's not actually referring to a raccoon. It's referring to the, the raccoon dog because that was their native species. Both are invasive in Europe though, um, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, so it's just, just like the red fox video that we had. This is another great example of a species that can be, you know, perfectly good where it's found, but if you take it and you move it somewhere else, it can cause a lot of havoc because it's interacting with species that just aren't used to having to deal with this. And it can cause a lot of problems. And it really is on biologists and, and the that local community to, to really take responsibility and, and try to fix our mistakes that we've made for sure. Yeah, and especially with a species that does really well around humans, you know, transporting it from a place that, first of all, it's not native to, the local wildlife aren't, you haven't evolved to interact with it. You're just kind of adding so much, like stacking so much in the raccoon's favor that, you know, like you said, can lead to some really detrimental impacts on, uh, like you were saying, like crayfish and salamanders and everything. Right, exactly. So to move on to some raccoon ecology, these guys, they're, they're a meso carnivore and they're highly omnivorous. I think, you know, people will know raccoons very much associated with people's garbage, hence their name Trash Panda. And, you know, that's just because they're so opportunistic. They can eat just about anything. But when they're in the wild, you actually do see a little bit of selectivity where earlier in the year they're eating more meat, animal protein. So things like invertebrates, um, mo mo mostly invertebrates, but sometimes even just small vertebrates as well that they can catch small reptiles, small mammals, birds, eggs, you know, small fish. And then as it gets later in the year and you start getting that more of that, that plant productivity, then they're switching and eating a lot of acorns and other nuts as well as lots of berries because those start popping up and that's a great way to fatten up because winters can be very harsh and raccoons don't hibernate in the technical sense where hibernating means that you sleep through the whole winter and you're also lowering your body temperature to be the same as the temperature outside. So bears don't actually even hibernate because they don't fit that definition, despite the fact that they are still sleeping and their body temperature does go down. Uh, it's not true hibernation, but raccoons don't even do, you know, that sort of hibernation that you think about. They just reduce their activity a lot and they will kind of stay in a, in a tree hollow or something to get out of the elements, but they're just reducing their activity. And so if the winter is particularly mild, they'll get out and be super active until a big storm hits or something like that. So it's just about kind of understanding what the weather is and how much energy they can expend to keep finding food and keep being active. Uh, but yeah, they're not true hibernators, but you will see a reduction in raccoon activity for sure during the winter. Um, and then another thing I think that is very important to address is the whole washing um, behavior. So very commonly people have seen raccoons picking up, you know, usually it's them catching like a crayfish or something aquatic and they'll dunk it in the water. And so what it actually is, is that the nerve system that runs through a raccoon's front paws is extremely tough and it gets an extra like tactile sensation when that is put in running water. And so it's just a way for raccoons when they have specifically aquatic prey, they don't do this when they're feeding on nuts and berries and stuff in a terrestrial environment they they put their hands in there to get that extra tactile sensation so they can really feel with what they're working with and what they need to manipulate so that way they can feed off of it. it it's not them oh i'm gonna clean this off which is you know what everybody's kind of tr treated it as that they're either cleaning their food or washing their hands it's it's not that behavior but it does look very very similar to that so it is an interesting quirk that's definitely stuck with the raccoon for a very long period of time yeah, and I think like one of those really famous videos is like of a raccoon being given like uh, cotton candy, if I remember correctly, and then mm -hmm. it dips that in water and obviously it dissolves and everything. 
Yeah. Because so. I think they, they looked at a lot of zoo raccoons for this, and they were mm-hmm. saying there's a very heavy bias to stuff that's aquatic base mm-hmm. that they're putting in into the water. As for uh, their social system, it tends to actually kind of vary quite a lot. Um, you do see there has been some pro- proposals that it's very like fission fusion based, but I think from what's been noticed mostly is that females tend to be solitary. And usually when you see a female with big groups, there's a lot of smaller individuals with her. And those are her kits from that year. And they can have, you know, a lot of kits. Sometimes they can have you know, big, big litters, especially in human dominated environments where they can get that food to put towards having more kits in a litter and there's less predator risk. So you can see some big raccoon litters. And so it could all just be a bunch of little ones following mom and you, you're seeing them a couple months later when they're almost her size. And with the males, you do actually see coalition behavior, which I think for most people, coalition behavior is most famous in lions and cheetahs, where you'll have a group of males, uh, sometimes brothers, but not always. It can be unrelated males sometimes coming together and defending a bigger territory. So that way they have easier mating access and they can defend it better from, from other males. And that does happen. But there's also certain areas like in the North Dakota Prairie, which is kind of this new frontier for raccoons that they've been able to expand into because of human habitat modification and predator extermination. You still kind of see one males holding his territory just because the it's not the greatest raccoon habitat. So the density isn't that high. And so in that situation, because there's not a whole lot of females packed into one area, it's not worth it to share with a couple other males because you're not mating with that many females over defending a big area. So it's better off that you just want to defend that by yourself. Plus, wouldn't resources in the environment also be fewer for the raccoon as well? Yes, because it's just, as as we said, yeah. it's, an, it's not a great it's environment. Not great. Yeah. They're able to tough it out because of just all the modifications that we've made, but it's not it's not ideal for them. So they generally have a lower population density, which means that the males in those areas, they tend to be a lot yeah. more solitary. Yeah, because a lot of times the food availability drives the density. And you know, like we were saying, if you have not great food sources, then it doesn't make sense to congregate in a bunch of individuals together. Right. But these guys, I mean, for carnivores, just like red fox, they breed really fast. Um, and they can breed in in pretty high numbers. And that's because they are still eaten by a lot of stuff. So just to give you an idea of a lot of the carnivores in North America that do hunt raccoons, you've got bobcat, mountain lion, gray wolf, red wolf, coyote, American alligator, American black bear even. There's been some opportunistic um, kills by, by black bears on raccoon uh even further south you've got jaguars killing them and um and then a lot of birds of prey so things like golden eagle and great horned owl and red-tailed hawk they'll all hunt raccoons for sure and so that really puts into perspective when you start losing a lot of those predators in certain areas then the raccoon population really goes up and so I'm sure that with the coyotes kind of recolonizing and, and bobcats starting to do better and better in some of these suburban areas, that's really going to put a nice uh, curb on on some of these large raccoon populations and kind of help them stabilize a bit better. Because right now, if they can have access to lots of garbage and bird seed that people put out in their bird feeders, you're going to have really, really dense raccoon populations for sure. And it's not something that people always think about so making sure that you can secure your garbage and not leave any attractants out in your yard is one of the best ways to kind of not have to deal with with raccoons getting into stuff and getting into mischief as their bandit mass kind of implies but really it's just them accessing easy food sources that people don't really think about because it's not something that they're directly consuming but it's stuff that all forms of wildlife will take advantage of And raccoons are one of the best examples of that. Yeah, especially with their ability to manipulate things really easily with their like front paws. 
Yeah. Very, very dexterous paws. Yeah. I mean, really, it's just they're, they're miniature bears. Exactly. Like, yeah. When when Linnaeus was doing his first round of taxonomy, he put the raccoon in Ursus. He said it was a bear. Uh, and that's because Linnaeus did a lot of weird stuff that did not hold up that much at all whatsoever. But one and and Procyonidae is as far as carnivore families go, it is fairly close to Ursidae mm-hmm. uh, within within that grand scheme. So it's not too too far off for sure. Um, but you know these guys can get in loads of different trouble even with conservation we mentioned how it's been an invasive species in certain areas but even in areas where it's native we've just increased the raccoon density so much that they've become a very very prevalent nest predator uh not just for different songbirds but even sea turtles and so sea turtles are very endangered due to a lot of human caused issues but raccoon predation at nests can be pretty pretty tough and so you'll even have areas where they'll have to translocate sea turtle nests to protect all of these eggs so that we can have the best possible chance of getting hatchlings back out into the ocean and raccoons are, are a major major predator and sure there's a lot of other things that'll eat baby sea turtles like tons of different birds as well as crabs and other small mammals but because we've just created ideal raccoon habitat raccoons will really really hammer some of these sea turtle nests along the gulf coast so it is some important management that we we have to do now because of you know these modifications that we've created on the landscape yeah and i think raccoons will even go after um like plover nests or not not necessarily nests but after the eggs um, yeah because they don't really make they don't really make too they'll go after the chicks even later and so I know a lot of times what they'll do is they'll build exclusion fencing so that the birds can pass through but the raccoons can't Yep. Well, raccoon I, I did a lot of that work when I was in uh, high school and it's for just about everything raccoons skunks yeah. foxes even bird predators yeah. like crows, and ravens. And crows and stuff like that yeah uh, house cats that people just let out and wander onto refuge land because animals don't care about human boundaries sorry they don't so and that was a big thing that we noticed on that project was I was looking at the coyote population and coyotes were really good combined with the fact that this was kind of some maritime forest with sand dunes. It wasn't the most productive habitat. So unproductive habitat combined with coyote predation kept these raccoons small and few in number because uh, a bigger raccoon is not going to be as fast and you're less likely to get high enough off the tree before a coyote comes and pulls you down. So that is important. And it was actually in, in this particular instance, coyotes weren't really hunting plovers that much, but they were taking care of raccoons and a lot of these other nest predators that are a much bigger problem for, for piping plovers, which is one thing that, that helps them out a little bit. Yeah. And even just kind of going back to predation by coyotes, you know, favoring smaller raccoons surviving. If you look at these animals just anatomically, they're not really built for like a lot of running like a a canid is they're you know more built for kind of climbing and slower movements on the ground like obviously they can run they can be pretty fast but that's not going to compare to like a a cat or a dog i mean they're they're fast compared to us but we're Mm -hmm. absolutely slow as a species Uh, really good endurance but laughably slow Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah these guys are fantastic tree climbers and you know they're always seeking out kind of tree hollows for you know either denning through harsh winters or bad weather um you know females will find them for for giving birth to kits and keeping them safe there uh so yeah trees are are really important to raccoons and that's why prairie can be a pretty harsh habitat and especially once you start getting good predator recovery in the prairie it could probably exclude raccoons again because they just don't have a lot of safe spaces for them to go and and escape predators in in those sorts of environments it's just too open there's not enough trees that they need to escape for sure um i guess a couple other things about raccoons is that uh these guys can be uh pretty important disease vectors uh Mm -hmm. justin kind of touched on this a little bit earlier with the distemper outbreak but rabies and distemper they they are pretty common vectors for um raccoon strains of rabies tend to be a little bit different from fox 
Uh, it's something that we call dumb rabies, where instead of acting aggressive and coming out of nowhere, like as we described in the Red Fox video, they tend to, you know, just kind of act a little bit loopy and confused and, and kind of being unafraid. Uh, however, the problem with that is those can also be symptoms for distemper, which is another fatal disease to carnivores. However, it doesn't affect people. So that's a big difference between rabies and distemper is they have the same exact symptoms. One affects people and the other one doesn't. So it's very, very hard to, as I said in the Red Fox, it's very, very hard to diagnose rabies in the field because there's so much that overlaps with distemper. But even with, with dumb rabies, a lot of that overlaps if a raccoon's been concussed. If he falls out of a tree and hits his head, that does happen. And they'll act very similar to that, but they can recover from that and be perfectly fine, or even just being hit by a car. So there are situations where just because a raccoon is acting weird and dumb doesn't necessarily mean it has dumb rabies. And yeah, and it other things you've got the uh roundworm parasite that's pretty commonly known that that they spread that through their feces which is why you always want to be careful around raccoon poop and it's why you don't want raccoons congregating in your yard because they're going to be pooping in your yard and that means there's going to be a lot of roundworm eggs in your yard and that could get spread on so it is very important to kind of clean up and seal up your attractants to to keep raccoons out of there but that's something that europe and japan are worried about because now the raccoons are bringing these diseases to these environments that aren't used to them so you can't have direct problems like raccoons going in and killing native species but then you can have these indirect problems where they're spreading these diseases that affect a lot more things than just what they eat yeah and there's even a term for uh when raccoons kind of congregate and poop in a similar area called latrines where it's usually like a spot can't remember how they choose it but it's a it's a pretty like secure location from yeah from, that's like one of the big things with with a lot of those like latrine sites i mean think about it like a like a bathroom like mm -hmm. you always are trying to kind of look for some good privacy and and there are animals that that do that as well and especially more so when they're when they're pooping you know urination is very commonly used as a territorial marker a lot of the time but but especially for for pooping that's not necessarily something that um is that is animals like to advertise and 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 you're more at risk because it takes yeah. longer yeah because cats usually hide their scat i don't think canids do as much because they kind of use it will it as... still kick the ground mostly the yeah. males but it's not well, it's not super common yeah and i think that's usually more for scent dispersal from the their glands and their feet it is but yeah but we do have a little bit of important conservation stuff to talk about with the northern raccoon specifically. So we're not going to be talking about the endangered pygmy raccoon. Um, we're not going to be talking about how raccoons are a problem to other animals in terms of conservation. But raccoons in some areas are facing very important issues that could wipe them out in their native range. And what I'm talking about specifically is the Everglades of Florida. Florida Everglades has a ton of different invasive species, but the one we will be talking about for this segment is the Burmese python, which is pretty famous because they're big snakes. They get really, really long. They can eat just about anything. And as time has gone by in the Everglades and these python populations have really grown, there's been a huge reduction to all small mammals in the Everglades. And that includes raccoons. Raccoons used to be super common in that region of Florida, and now they're almost non-existent. The raccoon population has declined by over by about ninety nine percent. Like that's a crazy amount of number, yeah. all because of this this one snake that somebody let go or or escaped from somebody's house. And it, as I said, it's not just raccoons. Opossums, a lot of the small rodents rabbits it's even affecting their predators like both species of foxes and bobcats so again you know not only can raccoons be a problematic invasive species but they can suffer from the hands of an invasive species in their native range and so there's a lot being done right now to eradicate burmese pythons as well as a couple of the other more damaging invasive species in the everglades to give native species like raccoons a fighting chance once again so that they can can become common again. 
Oh, so here we have the the kit. The kit looks really nice. You can tell it's it's a bit more slender mm -hmm. than than the adult, at least when it's walking. Like the walking was really nice there. Yeah. Um, but the yeah, the proportions of the head are really nice. Um, the tail could be a little bit longer, but I'm not gonna that's besides the point. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. I mean, this looks really good. I think it it just looks it, it just looks like it has kind of the adult markings like it doesn't have kind of the less defined you know kit markings to me personally uh i kind of uh, see it depending on the angle mm -hmm. um i think certain certain angles it doesn't look like the adult coloration but at other ones it does mm. um like i feel like right now um but like yeah when you go head on i i don't really see it and maybe that's just because most of the body's obscured maybe but I do like, I think, I think maybe it's the coloration that they were able to go with for, for the raccoon. This one does not look that cartoony like the red fox does. No. It's it's really nice in that regard. Um, I, I do like this one a lot. I, I don't know if this, this might be my favorite from the Twilight pack in terms of design, but um, yeah, we can, we can talk about that a little bit later. Do you have anything to add or? The kit looks like, like you said, the size of the head's good. The eyes aren't mm -hmm. super, you know, cartoony or anything. The snout. Yeah. I've also solid. been looking at a lot of raccoon photos for my job, mm -hmm. actually, yeah. because you're doing a lot of camera trap work in New York where there's a lot of raccoons. So, mm -hmm. you know, it looks a lot like the baby raccoons I'm seeing right now for nice. you know, mid late summer. Yeah. It's, you know, kind of the age group this this looks like. So, um, but yeah, we can. I don't know. We can check to see if there's any interspecies enrichment and yeah. then we can move to the, the tier list afterwards. Let's see. Yep, they got Procyon a day. Genus yeah. Procyon. Least concern, but again, in Florida, that doesn't mean they're doing well. Yeah. Oh, they do have male bachelor groups. That's cool. Oh, nice. Yeah, two to four sounds about right for a coalition. I mean, you, there's probably some mega coalitions that you get in certain areas, but I would imagine two to four is is what you normally see. So, no. Doesn't look like they have any compatible species. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Yep. So, uh, be, yeah, I mean, these both make sense for, like, if you're going to house them with something in a zoo, right, which is mm -hmm. not our expertise um but of course the striped skunk and the north american beaver are absolutely two animals that the raccoon overlaps with uh beavers of an important note because it also has that riparian dependency just like the raccoon historically did when it was in a more intact ecosystem throughout north america um, of course you have other species i mean a lot of the north american pack honestly the moose the cougar um american alligator they all you know would overlap really well with with raccoons um and even some of the stuff from the base game like the grizzly bear the gray wolf um you know i mean you could maybe argue some of the prairie stuff but prairie is kind of a bit of a frontier for raccoons right now and it's not really natural um but yeah even going down south into into central america you got jaguar you got uh, baird's taper uh as well um i'm just trying to think is there anything i guess red fox red fox is yeah. other the other twilight like that was the thing about the twilight pack is very like, like suburban north america with the raccoon striped skunk and red fox all getting in together for sure i guess jaguar could also be another one yeah I, I, yeah i said jaguar oh. um i think that might be it in terms of native stuff i'm not going to go into what yeah. they want to do invasively because we don't want to be we don't want them there <laughs> exactly that's, that's essentially what it is so i think that's we don't really have a lot of north american ungulates so it's mm -hmm. not um not really a lot they were up with there but yeah, yeah the only other one i could think of would maybe be like the because we have a north american river otter right no we don't oh we don't oh nope that's disappointing yeah uh, I think that's it. Yeah, I think it is. Like doll, doll sheep and Arctic fox are like too far north. Yeah. So, 
that's yeah that's kind of, i guess like california sea lion <laughs> yeah you know, there you go coastal coastal <laughs> raccoons um and gray seal but mm -hmm. yeah that's kind of it so i guess uh we can take it to the tier to list the tier list there we go okay so i pulled the raccoon out all right justin where are you putting this one i think i'm gonna put it in a um i think overall the design i think looks really good um the proportions look good to me the kind of uh back legs longer than the front legs you know that's pretty accurate yeah um yeah like the it doesn't have some of the cartoony look of some of the base game animals so i'd probably put an a tier yeah i'm i'm like on the fence i'm like do i want to put this as bottom of s or top of a because mm -hmm. it is like really good like it's yeah. crisp. like it's i think i think this is probably why they went with it as a flagship instead of the red fox because it looked better yeah but, um yeah i don't know um Here's my here's my question to you. What yeah. do you think of it compared to the links? To the links. Ooh, that's a tough one. Um I feel like with the links I had a few more issues with it, so I'd probably say ab above the links. Okay. Then we'll put it at the top of A just above the links. I think that's okay. that's good consensus. Yeah. All right. There we go. Perfect. Still a whole lot of A's, but <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we'll we'll get some of the the worst looking ones soon, and <laughs> then people can be like, "Oh, they're not just saying everything looks good." <laughs> but in order to figure that out, are you ready, Justin? I'm ready to, to spin, spin the wheel. The wheel. A lot of us. I think somebody's very happy right now. I am. That'll Aren't be a fun you? one. Yes. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, Justin loves monotremes. They're like one of his <laughs> favorite groups of all time. So the fact that we're going to get to do the only monotreme in the game, and it yeah. makes me very excited. I am. That'll be a really fun one. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, now you know what to look forward to next time. With all of that said, we are the Wildlife Wire signing off. See you next time.